Okay, ideally in embodied AI, uh, okay, so this way. Okay, so ideally in embodied AI, uh, we want our experiments to have these four properties. So we want uh, them to be reproducible, diverse, safe, and also, sir, can you speak into the mic? Oh, okay. And also uh, efficient. So I'm going to uh, talk about each, each of them uh, in the next few slides to, to explain what I mean exactly by these. So first, reproducibility. So these are two identical robots in, in two different labs, but it's very challenging for, uh, for example, for lab B to replicate, to uh, reproduce the results of lab, uh, lab A because the environments, the conditions are totally different from each other. So if I cannot reproduce someone else's results, I cannot uh, measure my progress. I cannot build on top of their, uh, what, what they have built and, and so on and so forth. The second property is diversity. So usually uh, when we do robotics experiments, so we are limited to uh, uh, our lab settings. So very uh, simple setup. Usually we put a table in front of the, the robot to, uh, to, do the, to do the experiments. And sometimes we put a uh, plain uh, colored uh, cloth on, on the table to, to make the perception easier for us. But reality is different. So for, um, uh, in reality, we, we are uh, faced with such such uh, scenes, which are visually uh, diverse, visually complex, and very different from our, our training environments, uh, the, the lab environment. The other issue is safety. Usually, we don't really want to deploy our models that are not trained well in, in the real world. And otherwise, uh, such, such things happen. So we don't really want to damage the environment, damage the, the, the uh, uh, robots and then people that operate uh, that are uh, next to our uh, robot. This thing doesn't work. Okay. So the other um, uh, property I want to talk about is efficiency. So on the left, you see this video uh, that um, so uh, by by other groups that they have trained this robot to perform the simple task of opening the door that's uh, placed right in front of the robot. Uh, and that took about like two and a half hours to, uh, to, to learn this task. Now imagine a slightly more complex task, like uh, point goal navigation, that the, uh, the goal is to move, uh, towards, uh, move towards a point in, in, in a room, in a, in a scene. And that required like 2.5 billions of interactions with the scene to, to learn something meaningful. So what does that mean? It means that if you have 10 robots that, uh, that are trained simultaneously, it takes eight years to, to finish. Okay, so there have been uh, some attempts in the past to, to come up with benchmarks that, um, that address, uh, but, but, they, uh, but they suffer from one or more of these issues that they talked about. So going back to 2007, so DARPA had this project, Learning Applied to Grand Robots. They ship these robots to different universities and, and companies. And uh, we train our we train the robots using our, our own training data. So this is me, uh, graduate student me, uh, back in 2007, collecting data using uh, using this robot. Then we ship the uh, ship the flash drive to DARPA, and DARPA uh, did the test for us in their, their in their own environment and reported the results by, uh, back to us. So it, this had like some. Uh, some issues because uh, the training environments were different. So the comparisons between different teams were not really fair. So I had access to this parking lot uh, in Atlanta, but probably this was not an option for, for the team in New York. And also uh, it required a big team of people to, to run the experiments, to, to debug the issues and uh, ship the robots and, and so on and so forth. So it was not really the sustainable effort. Okay, fast forward to 2022, we still don't have uh, good benchmarks for robotics, but there are some interesting efforts in, in that domain. So one of them is a uh, ranking-based robotic benchmark by Abinov and some uh, some of my uh, colleagues at, at the fair. And uh, so here's the idea. They say, okay, so you, do, you run your own algorithms, do local rankings and send the rankings to us. And we will uh, aggregate these, these uh, uh, these rankings to uh, to come up with a global ranking across like different different methods, and they also standardize objects and tasks. And but still, users need to set up the infrastructure, which means that the in, the, uh, the training data might be uh, might be different from from lab to lab. 
and that uh, rank. So it means that the ranking might be might differ significantly uh, based on based on the training data. So there was another interesting follow up work uh, that says uh, uh, the title is like train offline uh, test online. The idea is that okay, so we will provide you with uh, with uh, the offline training data. So you use that data to train your models, and then we will we will test that test the models for you. You submit the models, and we will test them for you. So the big challenge here is scaling up the number of tasks. So, uh, so that uh, if we want to do like a lot of tasks, that that would be quite quite challenging. And so we have to limit ourselves to a few few trials to for benchmark. And uh, so uh, there are similarities between chain and test environments, and also applying data is not really a good representative for interactions that happen at the tail of the uh, tail of the distribution. We really need to interact with the environment to to learn uh, these these types of interactions. Okay, some some people say uh, let's uh, uh, benchmarks discourage creativity and innovation. So let's let's ignore them uh, altogether. Uh, so I disagree uh, with this with this statement because um, so I. I I'm coming from a computer computer vision background, so these are two uh, two main uh, uh, tasks in in computer vision: semantic segmentation and object detection. And the x-axis is year, and y-axis is uh, some measure of accuracy. And as you see here, for example, for semantic segmentation, uh, uh, ten years ago the performance was like thirty percent. Now the performance is around like seven percent. And there was a lot of creativity and innovation to to improve uh, to improve the performance. Uh, uh, from like 30, uh, 30s to, to 70s. And yes, so some of some of the some of the methods are just small increments over over the other ones. But in uh, but overall, uh, there was uh, 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 now uh, it was it was a good effort. Now they can measure their progress exactly. Uh, they know like if uh, uh, how how things how things change and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, to have a reproducible, uh, diverse, um, uh, efficient, and safe uh, benchmarks, so we propose to use simulators. So simulator. Uh, so I'm going to talk about AI2 source simulator, a uh, simulator that uh, that we developed when, when I was at, at AI2, and uh, so it has three main uh, components: uh, Ithor, Robothor, and Manipulator. Ithor is mostly focused on um, mostly focused on uh, object state changes. For example, here, like opening, closing blinds, uh, uh, turning, off, turning, off, uh, turning off lights, and, the, and also it uh, accurately models the physics of the world. Like for example, here, uh, when you open the drawer, the, the pens roll and, and, and so on. The other component of uh, to Thor was, was Robothor. So Robothor, address the problem of simulation to real transfer. So we wanted to, uh, for some reason this doesn't work. Okay. So we wanted to uh, study simulation to real transfer in, in, a, uh, in a controlled environment. And uh, so we had some apartments and we made the exact same apartment in simulation. So this is this apartment in simulation. And uh, now it switches uh, to, to the real world apartment as you see the, the the, they're very similar, similar to each other. So the, the third part was uh, manipulator. The focus of manipulator was on uh, 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 performing robotic manipulation tasks using, using a robotic arm. So for example, on the left, you see the view of the robot. On the right is a third, uh, third person camera that, uh, so uh, here we abstract the way grasping. We focus mostly on on the uh, on planning for manipulation. So using these simulators, uh, we could uh, do uh, several different tasks like navigation, interactive question answering, instruction following, uh, to room rearrangement, and many many other other tasks uh, in the past in the past couple of years. So uh, to increase the diversity of the scenes. We propose to uh, procedurally generate these scenes. So this uh, this work is called Proctor uh, that got uh, that got best paper award at NURPS uh, a few weeks ago, 
And um, so here's the idea. So we sample a floor, a floor plan, we sample wall layouts and uh, furniture layout and texture and so on to generate new scenes. Uh, so this is this is one of the scenes I can I can show you more. Uh, so here, uh, so there are, there are different scenes generated by by the algorithm, uh, different number of rooms, different layouts, different textures, and 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 so on and so forth. Just to uh, put uh, put this in context, like for example, I Gibson Environment from Stanford has fifteen scenes. Uh, Habitat has 90 scenes, A24 has about like 200 scenes, uh, HM3D, uh, 1,000 scenes. And uh, so here we sample 10,000 scenes uh, uh, using this framework uh, to, to train and evaluate our, our models. So uh, an annotation comes for free uh, in Procto because we know what the objects are, we know where they are located and, and so on. And also uh, an interesting point about this framework is that the, all, all the objects are interactive. So we can interact with the objects and we can, we can uh, move them around. We can also met, uh, randomize the, the material and uh, create, uh, for, for the same scene, we can create like different appearances. Similarly for lighting randomization, we can change the intensity and the color of the light to, to simulate the different, uh, uh, different time of day or different uh, uh, types of lamps and, and so on and so forth. We can also uh, randomize object location. So it's basically uh, uh, we can uh, randomize objects following certain common sense rules. Uh, for example, a chair cannot appear on a stove and, and those, those types of rules. So we tested, uh, so we uh, trained our models on, on those 10,000 scenes, tested them for different, uh, different tasks. One of these tasks uh, was object navigation. The goal is to navigate towards an instance of an object, object category. And uh, we tested them in two, two different environments, uh, two, uh, Ithor and also Architecture uh, that they didn't uh, talk about. So EMB Clip is, is a state of the art uh, uh, navigation model. Zero shot means we just train on, on proctor data. We do not uh, fine tune on the train set of these environments. And fine tuning means uh, we fine tune for, uh, for that, uh, using the training data provided for, for, uh, for that environment. There are two different metrics, success and, and SPL, which is success weighted by path length and, and, and so on. As you see, uh, uh, when we train on proctor, we see uh, improvements, uh, sometimes like huge improvements, for, for these tasks. We also tested uh, our, uh, the, these um, on, on environments that are, that are different in terms of appearance, like Robotor and, and Habitat. So these are very different from Proctor scenes. It's still, we see the improvements across, across uh, these two environments. And that was interesting because uh, this is a scene in Proctor, a synthetic scene. This is a scene in Habitat, like uh, 3D scans of real environments. They're very different from each other in terms of appearance of statistics, but still we can generalize to, uh, to, to these environments. Uh, similar story for, for other tasks, like for example, re room rearrangement and manipulation. We again saw improvements when we use, uh, when we use uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the models that, that are trained on diverse data uh, uh, that the factor generates. And, uh, more interestingly, the, the model was super simple. It just uses an R, uh, use RGB images as, as input. Uh, we use a clip uh, encoder to, to, uh, to encode the, the images and there is just a GRU and we sample from, uh, from the output of that GRU to, to, uh, to output action. So there's no depth, there's no auxiliary losses, no mapping, nothing. It's just, just this uh, very simple, simple model. Also, uh, so I talked about the diversity of Proctor. Now I'm going to uh, very briefly talk about the recent advances in Habitat. Now we can, uh, we can do 100,000 steps per second. By step, I mean uh, uh, image rendering, physics simulation, and uh, forward, backward pass of neural network. Now we can, uh, and the speed up comes from large batch simulation, uh, physics simulation and rendering, and also uh, approximating the physics simulator uh, uh, in a way that doesn't hurt the, the final performance. And now we can do like uh, 15 billion interactions in just about two days. And uh, so now we have uh, these massive speed ups as well. Okay, so uh, finally suggestions for moving forward. I think we should invest more uh, time and money on 
uh, on developing more realistic uh, simulation of the world. And also we should use larger scale compute available to us for fast simulation of the world. For example, our colleagues in computer vision in NLP, they use, two, uh, they use hundreds of GPUs to, uh, to train their models. Why not using the same amount of compute to, to simulate, uh, simulate the world around us? Okay, that's it, thanks. We have some time for a couple of questions. So I guess you did something that was really interesting there where you obviously trained on a large scale simulation data set and you saw the Pittsburgh that you would have to have, which gets real global. And you know, I guess part of the conference is like, you know, if that lasted expensive or large set verifications. So I guess the root of the question is like when you look at those other simulated sets. Right, so you've sort of you know deployed into the other and you generalized those situations. Did you see the same kind of generalization out of that? Was it something you might have done differently? And the reason I'm asking that right, is if you can sort of show the generalization that other simulated seeds out of it, I think it's very strong indication that it would work in the real world. But I guess is that a sufficient kind of measure? So it really, uh, it really depends on the, it really depends on the simulation platform. So if your simulation is a good uh, representative of the real world or the ta uh, uh, for, for the task that you're considering, I think, yeah, that will be some, some correlation uh, between the simulation performance and real world performance. And then you, you can hope that, okay, so if I, if I improve my, my, uh, my models in simulation, they can better generalize to the real world. But if your simulation is not a good representative for uh, for that task for real world, probably uh, uh, as as we have seen. So I, I didn't talk talk about those. But for example, we improve this uh, performance uh, in simulation, but the performance on, on the real world stays constant. So it doesn't it doesn't improve. So really uh, depends on on the simulator on the task and 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 so on. So it uh, it cannot be uh, like. So say one thing that that this uh, covers like all all the cases. So that was uh, so because of the diversity, I think it learned a lot of uh, like for example, the, the appearance was very diverse from from scene between, uh, from scene to scene, and that helped the, the model to generalize better. While before that we use like hundred scenes uh, for training and hundred scenes is kind of limited in terms of appearance and we had like problems uh, uh, transferring to to uh, to a different domain or to the real world uh, because and we easily overfit to to that to the data that, that were available to us but um, but the diversity I think helps the the scale uh, this I mean the scale. Uh, when we say a scale, we mean we mean diversity. So the scale helps the diverse diversity helps. Yeah. Okay. Any follow up on, on Nick's question here? Um, diversity in, in visual representation is something that's that we've seen in this uh, seminar. But what about diversity in physicality, like complex modeling, uh, flippage, drafting, you know, benchmarking? Where do you think sort of the gap is to to that? I mean, do we like have a galaxy to different physics? So I think these 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 uh, physics and also appearance are are not really decoupled decoupled from each other. So they are we should consider both of both of them together. For example, uh, I uh, uh, I want to avoid these obstacles in front of me. So probably uh, I need to uh, I, I need to have a good visual per, uh, perception to to uh, uh, to uh, to take actions and and that also affect. Uh, Basically, a combination of appearance and dynamics of the work uh, 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 that, that influences my the actions that I take is not just appearance. So I think uh, for that reason, I think we need diversity uh, in both appearance and also in, in, in physics physics simulation. Like considering like different dynamics, probably different uh, uh, different contact forces and, and and so on. So, but I guess we cannot. Uh, uh, we cannot really dis disentangle these two. So, so let's uh, 
diversify physics simulation and ignore visual appearance, or let's diversify visual appearance and ignore like physics simulation. So, uh, so for the task that I talked about, it's mostly focused on navigation. So dynamics does not play like a very important role there. It's mostly like a visual task, but but I think yeah, in, in general, um, yeah, we need we need both of them. 